Turn it off the right. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all? Nice to see you. Thank you for uh, coming out in all the wet weather that we have today. Really appreciate that. Um, and thank you to Neil for starting us on our second set of lectures here. Um, and these are the foundations. They're going to get us ready to go into art with some of the historical stuff and get all of that going. I'm really excited. Hopefully we all learn a lot. I know I will. Um, let's see. We will be meeting here every Friday at 11 a.m. during the month of March um, for this series of lectures. And thank you, a huge thank you to Kevin and his AV team for um, getting us set up and so that we can broadcast this on the OLN and all that wonderful good stuff. That's a lot of techie stuff and takes a lot of effort to make that go, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce Neil, um, give you a smidge of his background, um, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, Neil Murray um, is a retired emeritus, I am saying that wrong, art professor and administrator from the North Park University. Uh, Neil has also taught at Wittenberg for eight years, if you all are Ohio Wittenbergers. Uh, Neil is also an active sculptor in all mediums, bronze, wood, metal, stone, acrylic, as well as some welding. He has completed over 20 large public sculptures, commissions, and has numerous one-man art shows, which are a lot of work to do. So. That's wonderful. Um, he would classify himself as a mid-century modernist, and he and his lovely life, wife, Marilyn, hi, Marilyn, moved to Goldfinch in October of 2017. So thank you so much, and I know he would love lots of questions. So you guys all think up one or two while you're watching all of this, and um, enjoy. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Frankly, I expected maybe four or five seats occupied in this room given the weather, but uh, I appreciate you noble, hearty few that uh, made it today. Um, today is a, a really important day. It, uh, I'm calling it Foundations because the, the whole series of lectures we're doing this spring, the five lectures, really are the beginning of the Western tradition in art. We're going, you're going to start to see the kind of art you're quite familiar with. And um, the foundations of that tradition we're going to touch on today. We're going to touch on Greece, and we're going to touch on Italy. In fact, though, these early cultures were kind of overrun by the later Greek and Roman cultures. So in fact, although they're the foundation of the things we're going to see later this spring, I'm showing you fewer works from each of them, and I'm combining them both in this first lecture, uh, because there are simpler, simply fewer objects to look at. And they will help you get a contrast between Greek and Roman art. Superficially, the average person finds them to be looking rather similar. 
But in fact, they start from a very different base, and the assumptions, the attitudes, the expressiveness, expressiveness of those works really start here. Now let me give you a, another little insight to where we're going today. Much of the art I'm going to show you, because it's very early, will look rather primitive to you. But I should let you know the pre my own prejudice and the prejudice of many artists and art historians. Most of us favor these very early traditions because the basic idea, the basic energy for a culture starts here. Now for the average layperson, it's much easier to judge technical quality in art than it is to judge the general virtue or importance of a tradition. But the important traditions start here. And so I like some of the art you're going to see today, which you might find very crude, because it tells me something fundamental. Uh, ideas starts here that lasts for hundreds and even thousands of years. You'll find the same thing when we get to the Renaissance next year. Giotto is a guy who starts it all, but when you look at Giotto's paintings and compare them to Leonardo's or Michelangelo's or Raphael's, they look crude, they look primitive. But the germ of the idea is there. The energy is there. And that's what you're going to see today. You're going to see rather primitive beginnings, but don't underestimate them just because they look a little crude and a little primitive. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started here. We're going to start, I'm showing you these two cultures together because chronologically they overlap each other significantly. They're close to each other. They rely on each other. And so in some ways they, uh, they belong together. The first object we're looking at, we're starting with Greek. And the first object we're looking at is called the Dipolon vase. Um, it's a big object. It's about as big as the image you see on the screen. It's 40 inches high. And it's from a Greek cemetery. And the way they did vases like this as funeral markers. The Greeks did not have a very elaborate understanding of the afterlife. They thought of it as a kind of shadowy existence, uh, just kind of half-life. Not a very elaborate eschatology or anything like that about the afterlife, just simply uh, we've got to find a way to make that afterlife better. So guess what they did here? They put holes in the bottom of this vase. This was a funeral marker. And it would be on the grave of a deceased. And guess why their holes are in the bottom? They poured wine in the vase so the wine could soak into the grave. And uh, needless to say, uh, there, there's an attempt to make a, a happier afterlife. It was done in a, uh, what we sometimes call a geometric style. Uh, if you look carefully, it actually shows a funeral procession. I guess I, is Eric, did he leave? Normally I have a button here and I point on things, so I'll go up. If you look in that upper row up there, uh, there's a reclining figure. There's a horse over here. There we go, a reclining figure. That's the deceased. And this is done in a primitive Greek style. Thank you, Jenna. This is done in a primitive Greek style that we sometimes call geometric. But it already tells us something about the Greeks. Let me explain how this is done technically. 
They work with a clay that's a reddish clay, rather like brick clay, and then they paint it with a black slip. Slip is simply liquid clay. And then they scrape away the black, or, uh, so they reveal black outlines. So this particular type of pot is simply called a black figure pot. Later on, the Greeks figured out a reverse way of doing this, and so they did red figures. But imagine the work it would take. Look at all the ornamentation on this thing. All of that is scraped away by hand. And imagine the level of planning to get that geometry right on this thing. Style-wise, yeah, it's simplified. But technically, it's an enormous feat. And anything, anyone knows anything about throwing pots, throwing a 40-inch high pot is no simple thing to do. In fact, it has to be done in, in sections. So this starts to tell us something about the Greeks. They really care about order and quality. OK, can we see the next one, Jana? This is a little bitty object. Notice the, me the measurement there. It's only two inches high. But I thought it's, it, it holds perfume. So a woman can hold it in her hand. And of course, it's a charming little owl. And again, you see it's done in the red figure, black figure style. But I wanted you to get a sense that sometimes when we look at these massive important objects from the ancient world, the objects that most, most survive in many ways tell us more about the culture are small objects. Monuments don't last as long as we'd like them to. to. The things that last are the small objects, just by the nature of their size. They, we have far more objects from the ancient world as small objects than we do as large objects. Any case, I wanted you to see, again, that sense of order, but you see how it's done in a geometric kind of way. Now, Jenna identified me as a mid-century modernist. I might very well make an owl very much like that. In fact, I've done a lot of owls. And in some ways, that created the prejudice that asked me to show you this object. Uh, but it, as you can see, it's, it's the quality of order. And now animation and charm is there. The Greeks start to try to really make sense out of nature, try to bring order to nature. Now, in, in trying to help you understand the difference between the cultures we're looking at today, I want to give you a couple words. There is philosophy that's identified with the Greeks. It's usually associated with Plato. And it's called idealism. The idea of idealism it sees nature, but it clarifies, simplifies nature. So there are no accidents. Nature fits into a, an order, an idea. Combine that or, or contrast that to a later development, usually associated with Aristotle, that we call pragmatism. And another word for pragmatism would be realism. It deals with the world as it is, not the perfect mathematic world we want, uh, but the world of imperfections, the world of order, but order that's slightly askew, slightly awry. Those are the fundamental principles you're going to be looking at today as we look at these objects. Now, can we see the next one, please? The Greeks were the first 
people who started to pay attention to artists in the sense they actually learned artist names. And so I can tell you who made this object. It's uh, done by a guy named Ezekias. And I'm showing you this particular object because it shows us the interaction between these uh, two cultures we're going to be looking at today. Dionysus was captured by some Etruscan pilots. The Etruscans are the other culture we're going to look at today. He was captured by these Etruscan pirates. And being Dionysus, of course, they probably captured him because he's got a wine. And uh, any good Italians want lots of wine, so they had Dionysus. Well, guess what? Dionysus started his grapes to grow on the mast of the ship. And this so frightened the Etruscan sailors, there were seven of them, by the way, that they jumped off the boat and they were turned into dolphins. So you see it's done in the black figure style with the sail being a white slip. And the shape of this object, you can't fully understand it. When you look at it from this view, it looks like a big bowl to you. It's not. It's a calyx. Calyx is a cup that the Greeks drank from. Maybe eight, ten inches across, a large shallow cup and on a kind of uh, pedestal. So we're looking right down on it. The reason the handles are there is to hold it while they, they drink. Anyway, you see Dionysus in his boat here. And one of the things I want to point out about this is not only as you, do you see the same sense of order and geometry you saw in the Dipolon vase, but you're also seeing more subject matter refinement. They're obviously moving closer to realism in the sense of a realistic visual appearance of an object. But notice that sail. You actually get a sense of wind billowing the sail. The Greeks are among the first people to really start to see because of their mind looking for order, they started to see laws. They started to see rules in nature. They started to pay attention to what nature does outside of a magical uh, conception. Remember last semester, those of you who were with me, we talked about magic, the idea of a world full of spirits that erratically sort of does things sometimes in whimsy. Now we're talking about a world of structure and order. Could we see the next one, please? I'm going to show you two uh, Greek figures, a female figure and a male figure. This is the uh, female figure. She's uh, 24 and a half inches high, and I think she's carved in limestone. And, and the form of the figure is what we usually call a kore, and it's a Greek word. It basically is a word for a woman who would be a, a maiden in a Greek temple. Notice she's clothed. You'll have to get used to the fact that the Greeks have a reverse concept of sexuality from West, the rest of Western culture. The Greeks viewed the male as beautiful and the female as kind of a flawed male. We only start to see nude female figures into the 300s uh, BC. It came very late in uh, Greek sculpture. The dominant figure we normally see is a male figure and the male figure nude. Now I'm carefully using that word nude. It's not naked. 
Naked means being self-conscious. Naked is a psychological state. Self-conscious of a lack, a lack of clothes. And in fact, when we see the first uh, nude female next week, we will see her in a very modest pose because she's self-conscious. She's coming out of the bath. The males stride forth in all their maleness with absolutely no hesitation about that. And can we see a uh, Koroi figure next, please? Notice she was only 24 and a half inches high. As we've talked about scale in these lectures, I tr although the scales all appear the same on slide format like this, I'm trying to get you to pay attention to that because it indicates something about social significance. Notice this guy is six and a half feet high and he, uh, he's striding towards us and he's really kind of primitive anatomy. But you'll notice if any of you remember our lecture on Egyptian art uh, in the fall, you'll see the same striding pose in Egyptian art. But there's a difference in the Greek work. The Egyptian art always has webbing in there. The Egyptians, and, and they don't give you this open space between the arms and the torso either. The Egyptian sculptures are, this is made out of marble, and the Egyptian sculptures are made out of a much harder stone, a black form of granite. And they're meant to give us a sense of timelessness. This statue has a much more fragile pose and it has a kind of energy in its stride. And if you look carefully at the face, you'll see what is simply, sometimes called an archaic smile. The next few works I'm gonna show you have this funny little smile on the face. We don't really know for sure exactly what they meant by that smile. We don't think it meant a particular psychological state. What we think it really is, is a way to animate the figure, look like there's something inside of it, some inner life. Uh, and so it's alive, it's not a timeless thing. It's a thing that's striding through real space. And of course, there's a primitive attempt at anatomy here but uh, it's, it's, it doesn't match what you'll see later on in this course. And I'm gonna show you a next one, which, which is, can I have the next one, please? This is more re, uh, a newer piece, and you'll notice the figure now has much more complex anatomical structure. They're much more aware of the body here, but it's still doing this striding kind of pose. It still has the archaic smile. It's really kind of a fixed, fixed pose. Eventually, that's going to uh, modify significantly. But uh, right now, you notice how the shoulders have a square axis and the hips have a square axis. So they don't really fully understand. They understand the shape of muscles. But right here, they don't understand how muscles work. Muscles work, I used to teach figure drawing, by the way. So I used to teach anatomy in a figure drawing class. And one of the things I try to help the students understand is how muscles work. They work in general opposition. Usually, for instance, when my biceps tighten up, the bottom of my arm gets all flabby, flabby, because that muscle is relaxed. So muscles, if they tighten on one side, they get soft on the other. And so it's a dynamics, complex set of relationships. They don't fully understand that yet, but you see how they're getting much closer to that understanding if you compare this figure 
to the last one. Can we see the death? Now you see how the female figure has also uh, become much more sophisticated here. This is a broken figure. It actually comes from a, uh, a pit along the edge of the Greek Acropolis. The Greeks were constantly at war with the Persians. And the Persians came into Greece in an earlier period of, period of time, and they, they uh, totally overran Athens. What you did in the ancient world, if you conquered a society, the first thing you do is destroy the temple structures. You destroy the religion, because that takes away their sense of meaning. Then you take their clothes away, because that, that establishes their sense of identity. So they, the Greeks always use, the Athenians always use the Acropolis for their sacred buildings. And this particular Kore was one of the temple maidens in the Acropolis. The Persians destroyed the whole thing. And so these, this thing was lying on the ground as a piece of rubble. When the Greeks came along to rebuild the Acropolis, and you'll see that rebuilt Acropolis next week. These things just got pushed off the edge. The Acropolis is a high, flat uh, plain in the middle of Athens. One of the reasons I wanted to show you this, you see how much more sophisticated this figure is in terms of the carving. Because it was buried in this pile of rubble, it still retains its paint. And I wanted you to see that, because most of us see Greek work in the Greek and Roman work typically in these pure white things. In fact, these things were generally painted. This is another attempt at their sense of lifelikeness, so they would paint it to, to look like life. This figure, of course, retains some of her paint. Can we see the next one, please? OK, now we're going to start to talk about the Romans. But in fact, we don't call them Romans. We're calling them Etruscans. If any of you have been to Tuscany, Marilyn and I lived in Tuscany a couple, for a couple, a couple different occasions when I taught our history and drawing in Florence. The name of Tuscany comes from the word Etruscan, and the Etruscans sort of lived along the west side of Italy, no further south than Naples, and not far north like Turin, more, more in the area between Florence and, uh, and uh, Naples or Rome. And Rome, of course, is roughly in the center of that area. And so it, the Romans eventually took over Etruscan uh, culture. But you'll notice the dates we're looking at here are overlapping the Greek dates. But what you're going to see is, even though they're at the same time, these cultures talk to each other. They travel among themselves. They're, uh, Greek uh, city-states on uh, the Italian peninsula. So they interact, but they're different in, in a fundamental way, and that's going to shape the whole direction of Western art. Can we see the first example here? Now this is a uh, ceramic sar sarcophagus from a very prominent grave center in a place in Italy called Servitiri. And it's, uh, these things are called neacropolises, in other words, cities of the dead. And the Etruscans buried their dead in these large areas. And in a, mo a moment or two, you're going to see the tomb in which 
this couple actually resided. This is actually made out of terracotta, in other words, a fired uh, brick clay. And I wanted, I wanted you to get a sense of this subject matter. This is a tradition started by the Etruscans that is persistent throughout Roman culture. The idea of a loving, caring couple. We have all seen way too many Hollywood epics about Roman uh, misbehavior. And we forget the fact you don't build an empire, the first major empire in the world, for several hundred years on uh, fun and circuses. You build an empire on stable family values. And we tend to miss that sense in Italian culture. But if you live there, you see how close fa Italian families are. And that's just been a persistent pattern throughout that entire culture. So they represent these couples. They would be buried in this ceramic object. And you'll notice the style of the figures. And, and even look at the, uh, the archaic smiles on the figures. Notice how they're rather like the quarry that we saw. They uh, pretty much uh, interact with uh, that culture. Now, she was holding a particular object here that's no longer part of this uh, ensemble. But uh, anyway, you get a sense of this kind of a relatively happy, affectionate relationship. Now, keep in mind, this is in a tomb. These people are reclining in a tomb. Now, can we see the next one, please? Here's a, a wall of one of those tombs. So they painted with a technique we call fresco painting on these walls. Now, th this is called the tomb of hunting because you'll see these uh, figures in a boat, uh, the other figure on a shore over there, and of course the birds flying and fish. And uh, if you look at the top uh, panel up there in the pediment, you see another ensemble of, of figures, some of them dancing. This is not a dark, difficult idea of the afterlife. Now, keep in mind, these cultures are seeing each other. Remember, we saw Minoan work last time, those of you who were with me there. And you see the influence of the Minoans here. Anyway, imagine this couple in a space like this. Now, the other thing I want to help you understand here is the reason you get these big rooms, almost like homes, in these neocropolises is because of the peculiar character of the soil in Middle Italy. It's a type of soil that we call tufa, T-U-F-A. Tufa is a volcanic material. It's a strange kind of material. It's, it's gray, has a kind of consistency of clay, so it can be dug into. But after it's dug into and exposed to air, it hardens up and becomes a rock. So, for instance, the Roman catacombs are all dug out of, out of tufa. So all they did is dig this thing out. They didn't build it. They dug it out, then they plastered the walls over the tufa, and then they did their fresco painting on that wall. Can we see the next one, please? Now, this is a little later piece. And I wanted you to see that there, the Etruscan concept of death is quite different from the Greek concept. 
Here you have a youth reclining, and he's with a, a demon, but in fact, the figure is an angel. In the Western tradition, a Christian tradition, we would think of that figure as an angel. And she's a kind of guardian figure. She's a kind of comforting figure for him. Uh, again, notice the style of the figures somewhat parallels what we saw in, uh, in Greek culture. But she becomes a guardian figure for him in the afterlife. And this is carved in stone. Can I see the next one, please? This is called the Tomb of Reliefs. A relief is a flat sculpture that's sort of halfway between two-dimensional art and three-dimensional art. And if you look carefully, you see all these reliefs, again carved out of tufa. But what, are, what do we see there? Kitchen utensils. They're preparing for a happy feast afterlife. Again, it's not this dark Greek concept of this uh, afterlife. There are little shelves all around the perimeter there, and some sarcophagi would be in those shelves. But if you look on the pillars especially, you see vases, uh, knives, flails, uh, hatchets, uh, pots and pans, all kinds of things sort of preparing you like the Egyptians did for some sort of an afterlife. And again, that's all in tufa, so it all had to be scraped out of the ground. They even give you ceiling beams as if this is, is like a real sculpture. And the reason we found these things is because they put a mound of earth over them. So you find this whole cluster of hills in a certain area, you dig into those hills, and you get into some of, the, some of these tombs. Now, can we see the next one, please? I want to help you understand how Roman religion differs uh, from Greek religion, and it gets a start with the Etruscans. Next week, we're going to be looking at Roman temples. And uh, the Etruscans made very different temples, and the temple helps us understand how the Etruscan culture was different from the Greeks. If you look carefully at this temple structure, by the way, this is just a model. Their temples were in wood. Greek temples were in marble, so they still exist today. Etruscan temples all have long since crumbled away. But we, did, we do find the foundations of them. If you look carefully, at this temple, you see three doors. There's a porch and then three doors. Those doors lead into worship chambers. Now, there's a fancy word for these chambers. They're called cella. And we're going to come across that word again next week when we look at the Parthenon. They're the house of the gods or goddesses. They literally are the house of God. The temple is thought to be a sacred precinct where the God actually lived. And we still have that particular concept today in our churches. We call them houses of God. And that varies from traditions. For instance, I tend to come from a Lutheran tradition. And the Lutheran tradition it takes this concept more literally. So an important part of the service, we always face towards the altar. Because this, the whole intention of the service is not ourselves, it's God. God is the focus of the, of the, the service. I used to be one of the liturgical assistants 
at one of our Lutheran churches. And I used to, uh, we did communion always around the altar. Everything centered around the altar. But here you have the location of the deities. If you look carefully, you'll notice the center door is slightly bigger than the, si the side doors. There are three deities here, and the, uh, the center deity was Juno. Juno was a sort of the uh, Roman version of Zeus, sort of the, the main god. So the Etruscans figure, well, we got three deities. Why don't we just make a temple for all of them? The Greeks would never do that. You go to the Acropolis in Athens, the Parthenon is there for one god, goddess, uh, Athena. That's where Athens gets its name. The Greeks had this idea of a kind of ordered concept. This is too messy. This creates a complicated theology. What's Juno have to do with Minerva and so on? Uh, it, it, but they don't care about that. These are the ones we got, so we house them. There they are. The other thing they do is the temple has a clear front. And it has steps on that front. And uh, it has columns there, but the columns don't go all around it. Again, that kinds of, creates a kind of asymmetry in the building. The Greeks want a much more ordered structure than that. So they make what we call a peripetal temple. The columns go all the way around it, and you can hardly tell the front from the back. Now the other things the Etruscans do, remember these are wooden structures and wooden columns. Only the, uh, the pedestal, the so-called, the Greek word for it is stylobate, uh, for that temple is in stone. You'll notice on the roof of the temple, they place all these terracotta figures that are going to represent a whole pantheon of important uh, deities. And can we see the next one, please? This is an Apollo in terracotta that came from the top of one of those temples. We call it an Apollo, but uh, of course it, it wasn't signed, it has no name. Probably represents uh, Juno. As you see, it's somewhat damaged, but you'll also see something about it that reminds us again of the Greek quarry. Notice he's striding forward. Notice his uh, anatomy, especially in the lower legs, you see veins, you see, you see the gastro muscles. Um, it's kind of diagrammed anatomy. He also has a car, an archaic smile. The reason the limbs are broken off is because it exists in space. The Egyptians wouldn't do something like that. The Egyptian statues, although they're, although they're far older, are much more intact than these Western uh, statues because we start to expand out into space. Now it has this funny ornamental section in the middle there because this thing is made out of terracotta. Remember, it's simply made out of clay. Well, how do you support something like that when you're making it out of the soft pliable material? So they create this kind of uh, armature that's an ornamental structure that uh, helps support the, uh, the figure. But the figure originally would have been attached to a roof of one of these Etruscan temples. Can we see the next one, please? This is a, a really famous Etruscan work. It's confusing to people 
because it represents two different styles and two different periods. The she-wolf, the main bronze figure, is Etruscan. But the two figures beneath her, suckling, are the founders of Rome. Any of you know the names of the <coughs> founders of Rome? Romulus and who? Remus. Remus, Romulus and Remus. Anyway, that's a much later Renaissance work, and you'll notice the style is much more realistic. Now this piece is in bronze, but I want you to notice how energetic and fierce looking this wolf is. Now they, again, don't fully understand the anatomy of wolves, but you, you can see that the whole statue has a sense of incredible kind of energy to it. It doesn't have that sense of calm that's a part of the general Greek sensibility. It's, it's encountering life where there are dangers, where one has to be fierce. And uh, ancient bronze carving or casting is uh, among some of the most refined casting that we've, uh, we encounter in the art world. Look carefully at the mouth of the she-wolf. That's all cast in bronze. And uh, being a sculptor and a person who's done bronze casting, I know a little bit about this. This, this would have been made in clay or plaster. And then molds made of that original. And then those molds put together. And by the way, the molds have to be, they're usually called investment. They're made out of a, a heat retardant material. And then these molds get put together like a puzzle. And then molten bronze gets poured into that, that puzzle. And uh, because bronze, it's, you, you have to have it around 2,000 plus degrees for it to cast well. You have to keep the mold hot so the metal will not freeze in the mold before it gets to the extremities of the mold. And sometimes uh, large bronze have to be cast in several pieces because they're so big, the metal would freeze if it went the whole length of the, uh, of the sculpture. But anyway, this is an Etruscan bronze, and uh, you can see the kind of fierce energy that becomes a part of the, um, the Italian tradition. Now, I think I'm getting pretty close to the end there. Is that our last one? Do we have more yet, Janet? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to finish with this one because I want to highlight the point that I made with the uh, Servitieri couple. This is in uh, marble now. You'll notice its date. We're moving along in time. It's seven foot long. This is the top of a sar sarcophagus. And you notice again this idea of a loving couple here. I, I, I want to leave you with that impression because you know, if I show you some images, which I'll probably show you next time, of some of the stuff from Roman culture, there will be pornography there. And everyone will just wonder, how did, how did, that, how did they do things like that? Well, that's such a minute part of that culture. But because it's, it stands out to us, we tend to think it's, it's everywhere. And it's what they're all about. This is much more what they're all about. It's a beautiful, tender carving of a final embrace. Now, I normally try to leave about 10 minutes. I've been rushing along a little today. This is a trial lecture today, because I've been, I was saying to Jana when we started to 
these lectures together, that Greek and Roman is so rich. I don't know how I, I can give an adequate summary of those cultures in the amount of time I've got. So I started with this foundation idea. And the next thing is it's almost painful to eliminate beautiful objects and in fact, to give you a summary, I had to do that. But it, it just was getting too painful. I couldn't eliminate beyond 15 or so. And so this lecture today is my trial lecture. Can I get through 15 slides in one lecture and leave a few minutes for questions? Apparently I have. So can I uh, deal with any questions here? Anyone? There, I'm going to say bronzes, because it's a casting technique, there can be multiple bronzes. That particular uh, she wolf I showed you is in the Vatican Museum in Rome. But downtown Florence, in one of the markets, in the front of that market, we had the same statue as well, uh, recast from, from the original. So there are multiples. By the way, the way you can tell the difference between an original bronze and a uh, cast, a uh, series cast, is the series piece will be slightly smaller. Because remember, you're making a mold from that original. Now, what, what does metal do when it cools? When it cools, it shrinks. And so the cast pieces are slightly smaller than the original. But otherwise, if it's a good cast, uh, they look identical. The other thing I should tell you is a guy who's done bronze casting. In fact, some of my bronze work is in the School of Music at Wittenberg University here over in Springfield, Ohio, I did three bronze panels for the, the school, the school of music based on groups of instruments. These things come out of the mold not looking at all like what you see. Because you have to pour metal in that mold, you don't know if the metal, the mold's full until the metal comes, start to come out of the mold. Well, guess what happens, that metal is going to harden up just like the sculpture. That's called a sprue, and you have to cut that off. Also, the joints on the mold tend to show up on the bronze. The whole process is called chasing. So a bronze comes out of a mold looking awful. And then you to be a good chaser, you have to find a way to get it back down to looking like the original. Sometimes that also means you're casting an arm in one mold and the torso in another mold. They two have to be welded together. Has to be done in a way exactly like the original. Can I help any other questions here? I don't want to give you too much technical stuff about sculpture. Being a sculptor, it's hard for me to stop. <laughs> Anyone, can I help you? What I want you to leave from today is the Greeks want a perfect, beautiful, ideal world. The Romans want a realistic world, exactly like the world in which they have to function. The reason the Greeks never created an empire and what they had fell apart, because they couldn't get along with each other. The Romans, said, we got to be practical about this business. When we conquer people, we don't destroy them. We bring advantages to them. So they want to be a part of this whole governance system. And the Romans created a true empire by uh, doing things like that. They were pragmatists. They knew how to get along in the real world. The Greeks wanted a perfect world, and unfortunately, the world doesn't quite, if you look at the first uh, chapters of our Christian tradition in Genesis, 
You see, we're talking about a broken world, a world that, that isn't perfect. Can I help anyone with a question here? We got four or five minutes. You're probably all hungry, want to leave for lunch right now. <laughs> anyone? Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know what uh, hardships you encountered getting here, and I appreciate it. Thank you.